Hello and welcome to another episode of Face to Face. My name is Godfred Akoto Boafo. My guest today is a politician. He's an academic. He's a diplomat. He's an administrator. He's an old student of Prepper College. Of course, I have to add that. My <laughs> guest today is Bafo E.J. Bewa, Ghana's ambassador to the United States of America. Ambassador Bewa, hello and welcome to Face to Face. And thank you very much and uh, thank you for having me. And may I say hello to your viewers? Yes, you, are, you, you sure. can say hello to my viewers. What is Ghana's ambassador to the U.S. doing in Ghana? We are expecting to meet you in the streets of Washington. Not at uh, yeah, Washington is the base. But for the kind of work we do, sometimes we have to do some follow-ups here. Essentially, this time I came to uh, have some discussions and also shepherd uh, the organizing committee of Memphis in May. Mm. And uh, Memphis, Tennessee is honoring Ghana next year for the whole month of May. Wow. So the organizing committee came here to familiarize themselves with the country and also help as it were tease out as it were the parameters of the program that they will have for us for the whole month of May. So it was my responsibility to show up just in case there are certain issues to be teased out. You, you've become quite the astute diplomat, considering you did not set out to be a diplomat, did you? No, um, I started earning a living as a, a lecturer in the geography department at Legon. Geography? Personally, I had wanted to be a lawyer, but my mother wouldn't have it. Hmm. Because she says lawyers, when the truth sits here, the lawyers look that way. <laughs> And she didn't want her son running around the world earning a living by lying. According to her. So according to her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, I read geography at the University of Ghana. And you taught a bit of it as well? Yeah, because uh, subsequent to that, I taught uh, for one year as a teaching assistant, then went to the States for postgraduate work, mm. and then came back to lecture at Legon. Oh, okay. I, you, you have an interest in slums, ghettos. Yeah. Talk to me a bit about that. I've seen, you've done a, <laughs> no, you did an interesting comparative analysis of sure. a U.S. slum and the West African Zungu. Yeah. Let's talk about that a bit. Well, in fact, that was my first published work. It's in a, a book of readings. Mm. And I did it when I was doing my master's in Wisconsin. And I have had an interest in, as it were, urban uh, planning and land use, you know, a planning. And somewhere along the line, especially in the West African context, we always lost the fact that the Zongo originally was the place where most strangers first, you know, settled. Basically for, uh, as it were, safety reasons. Mm -hmm. Because normally if you went to some kind of town, you would want to know where people who are most likely going to understand you would be. But somehow we have made it possible for the Zongos to become slums. That they were not inten originally intended to be slums. Mm. Now the comparison I, I did with the, uh, with the ghettos in America was also because you know, the ghettos became the residence of black people after especially the Jewish people who used to live there first had left. So again, even though it was a matter of a certain kind of safety in the environment, it became, you know, as it were, areas of deterioration. So there was this comparative element between the two. Mm. And as uh, I was interested in the development of the urban environment, looking at issues like the entry and exit of um, commercial you know, outlets and whatnot, I got a fascination in it. So I, I did that study. And then when I was doing the PhD, I did um, a study on the socioeconomic areas of the Louisville ghetto. Mm. Again, to draw up the fact that even within that environment, there are going to be differences on the basis of population characteristics, economic undertaking, and things like that. Interesting. Yeah. And from then on, you decided to 
move into other areas as well. What did you do after that? Well, when I came to Lagos, uh, after three years, I realized that I needed to go out to work to save some money to fund my research mm -hmm. because research funds at Legon in those days were quite minuscule. And I ended up going to the tourist board mm -hmm. as the, um, at that time I was what, managing director of the tourist control board. Okay. And I came for two years because that was the length of my sabbatical. At the end of the two years, what I had was that friendly the government and the university were discussing as to whether I could stay at the board or I had to come to Legon. Uh, nobody consulted me. All that I got was that a letter went to the university saying that for the exigencies of the public service, the government is asking me to stay at the tourist board. So mm -hmm. I stayed at the tourist board for eight years. Your two years became eight? It became eight. In the course of it, the organization changed, so I became the first executive director of the tourist board. Mm. Yeah, so that, that is how I ended up, you know, in uh, management. And mm. did you have an interest in politics at that time? Well, as for politics, I've always argued that as long as you are a citizen and paying tax, you are a politician. But, you know, my interest in politics actually started when I was, uh, uh, before I went to secondary school, because that was during the period of the NLM, in the lead to independence. And um, my dad had the responsibility for taking care of people who were then called action troopers, you know, for the uh, NLM. And also where I grew up, in the uh, Tipping's Palace, uh, it was more or less the uh, one of the cauldrons of you know Ashanti politics at the time. Mm. And in fact, when um, Kwame Nkrumah abolished um, public assemblies, um, the NLM had, and then the other opposition uh, you know parties when they joined up, had their rallies inside that palace. Mm. So basically, you wake up in the morning. And uh, you smell politics. Maybe in the afternoon you eat a bit of politics. And then in the <laughs> evening you sleep a bit of politics. So you, you were basically trained in the heart of resistance politics at the time. Yeah, I, I don't suppose it was so much resistance politics as to... Um, it was an effort to rectify, you know, the, the, you know, the, the kinks in our political system because of the fact that um, the there was the at least fear that independence, the way it was being driven, was going to disadvantage certain areas of the country. Mm. And the Ashantis had maintained an argument that they were never a part of the colony. And therefore, if the UK was giving uh, independence to its colony, we would rather want to stay out. Mm. Yeah. But later on, you know, as a result of... Uh, discussions and such, and the British sent um, uh, a minister to come and negotiate with the Ashantis. The Ashantis agreed to go into independence Ghana with an amendment to the constitution that every region will have a regional assembly that will have some aspects of autonomy. Mm. But anyway, that aspect of the constitution was um, quickly set aside you know, after independence. Now, the regional assemblies were abolished. So you, you've, you had the interest, you had been brought up in it. You grew up, made your connections, and eventually became an ambassador to Japan, first of all. It yeah. was in 2000, mm -hmm. under President Kofor. Sure. Where did you meet him? School? Oh, of course, I met him in school for a year. But he was ahead I, of you? Yes, he was. And I, I don't suppose um, I ended up uh, as an ambassador because I met him in school. And then also, whilst uh, in, the, in the era of uh, President Rawlings, in the you know, earlier years, uh, I spent uh, some 10 days in the guard room, mm. partly because I resigned my job from the tourist board, and I went through a whole bit of investigation and such. In the end, I decided that the better thing to do was to relocate. So I went to Britain, oh. and I 
I worked for the British government, mainly in education and training and consultancy. And during that time, we were organizing the opposition from outside. Okay. So I ended up being the treasurer for the organization and being the secretary. And then when party politics were allowed and the NPP came in, we converted the organization we had into the UK and Ireland branch of the party. And I ended up as the chairman after Mr. J.H. Mensah came home to contest. Mm. So I was, I was chairman over two elections until the president, uh, President Kufo, came in. And after that, I was sent to Japan, and I, I was there for eight years. Yeah, I, I, I realized you also had extra duties for parts of the Pacific, so you were... Uh, yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was responsible for uh, New Zealand, Australia, Papua New Guinea, and Singapore. Mm -hmm. But I, I was fortunate enough that when I first met the Foreign Secretary for Australia, I did ask him that Australia should reopen their High Commission here. Mm. And I remember him telling me that, no, we closed ours first, so we should reopen. And I told him, well, we are a new government, so they should invest some confidence in us. They should reopen theirs first. Fortunately, they acceded to the request, and they reopened their High Commission. So we also reopened ours in Australia. And uh, I think there was good advice to the president that in that case, they should send the High Commissioner to Australia, who then could take care of New Zealand and Papua New Guinea. So I was left with Japan and Singapore. Japan is a fascinating society, isn't it? Tell us a bit about, we, we hear about this country where they work really hard. They have rules. They follow rules and have moved, have made such strides after facing such adversity. Tell us a bit about that. How have they done it? Well, Japan for me is, a, is fascinating. Japan and probably Singapore, mm. the two do demonstrate what a people can do if they are determined to do things for themselves. Well, for instance, what, what has Singapore got? A little island, a small river, and a little bit of an upland. But you look at Singapore and you have to marvel. In the same way, you know, with Japan, what has Japan got? People, mountains, rivers. But somehow or the other, uh, nobody needs to tell anybody what Japan actually is. And I usually, when people ask me about Japan, I, I just say that the only thing wrong with Japan, as far as I'm concerned, is that everything works. And in the Japanese Prime Minister's office, mm. you know, there is this long corridor. And there are these two pictures. One, Tokyo today. The other one, Tokyo immediately after the war. Now, it will be very difficult for one to accept that both pictures were taken from the same point because of the difference of the panorama that those two pictures show. And it tells you what uh, hard work, determination, a certain kind of direction, and a certain kind of acceptance that this is our country and that is what we are going to do for ourselves. Mm. That is what Japan you know, uh, is to me. It's an inspiration. And especially for our kind of country, mm -hmm. which has everything and anything that it takes for any society to develop a good country. Japan tells us we don't have an excuse. We, we are one country that basically has absolutely no reason to be poor. But we are poor because we've managed to indulge ourselves. We've managed to believe that um, sometimes we, we seem to behave like a government is not even a team. And uh, if there is no team, of course you aren't going to score too many goals, are you? And for some reason... We are always, you know, sort, we appear to be pulling each other apart. 
You know, some of us don't talk to other people for whatever reason there might be. But I believe that we never started like that. Because when I graduated from the States, I had about three job offers. Mm -hmm. But I, I said I was going home. Two reasons. I believed very strongly that the Ghana I left was going to be much better than the States. And of course, I also miss my mom, so I came. But I don't know why in the process we seem to have lost the, 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 the Ghanaian character. We, we seem to have lost it. We are pulling apart very easily, sometimes over insignificant issues because a lot of us don't put the nation or the community or what have you first. And that is something that would always militate against development. And we have perfected the art of uh, giving excuses instead of finding reasons to do things. That's the difference. Mm, interesting. So from then on, I, I want to end the look at your path and then we'll delve into sure. what your current job is. You want us to become president? Oh, yeah, I came to contest um, when... Uh, yeah, you were a the, the 17th. Yeah, I was a 17th. You were one of them. I was 17th person. You were the 17th when, elective. Yes, when I came, uh, I think I had just about two and a half months to campaign. Mm. Uh, I got some respectable advice from uh, the then president to ask it to rather support one of the 16 people. And I felt that, well, something that you believe you can do better, you don't delegate. But then also, I had my decision to contest was on a point of principle. Which was? In the sense that I knew that at that time, there had been a certain kind of unstated um, decision that after President Kufo, uh, I think Kufado was supposed to be, you know, next. As far as I'm concerned, that basically indicated that the party was always prepared to groom, to polish up people, so that at least at, even, at any given point in time, the party ought to have a certain platoon that they can push forward. Mm. So when it appeared that that was... Um, not exactly what was going on. I felt the only statement that I could make in that case was to, you know, throw my hat in. I wasn't expecting to get a single vote that much, I, I was oh, sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I got six. So my argument from then on was that on pro rata basis, I won the election <laughs> because people had been at it for years putting in a lot of resources and all that. And if you saw my campaign team, it was basically a ragtag army of, you know, very uh, people with very nationalized attitude. Mm. Yeah. So in fact, I, I myself was seriously surprised that I, I got six votes. In so that contrary to, you know, popular opinion that <laughs> Bafue J. Bera was disappointed and had six votes, you saw the positivity in that outcome? Oh, of course. Uh, I mean, one would be disappointed in the sense that on the one, two, three sort of count, mm. you didn't win. But then, on comparative basis, you ought to feel satisfied that at least there were six people who saw what you probably could, you know, put, uh, put in in the name of the country. And then, of course, um, looking at the figures, you know, that the others who believed very strongly that they were going to win. Um, it makes a lot of, um, it has to fill one with a certain sense of pride that at least you made a statement and some people recognize the statement. All right, then. You're watching Face to Face, very interesting <laughs> <laughs> description of his uh, contestation of the MPP flag bearership prior to the 2008 election. My guest is Ghana's ambassador to the United States, Bafo Eje Bewa. Face to face returns.
Welcome back to Face to Face with Balfour AJ Bewaganes, Ambassador to the United States. So, Ambassador, let's talk now about your job, what you do in the United States. And top of the head, first thing that comes to mind, most Ghanaians want me to ask you, what is the migration status like, Ghanaians to the U.S.? I'm sure that is one of the biggest headaches you, ha you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I, I think uh, you probably are aware that um, the U.S. government imposed some visa restrictions uh, mm -hmm. on Ghanaians on their view that um, we were not helping to deport Ghanaians who had been slated for deportation. Mm -hmm. And as much as one would accept that any country can decide you know, as to whom they would want to be in their national territory or what have you, the whole bit of international relations would also impose certain procedures on them. What you know, I inherited basically was a, a listing of Ghanaians who were supposed to be deported. And the issue or the process was that uh, somebody presents the embassy with a list of Ghanaians to be deported. And then the request is that within a certain time period, mm. you do the documentation for those people to be deported. My view was that, yes, the U.S. has the right, but then, two, if I have to accede to a request that gave documentation for so-and-so to be deported to Ghana, I owe it to the country and I owe it to the individual to ensure that that person is indeed a Ghanaian. Mm. So we have to, as it were, do a little bit of you know, research on this. It takes time, it costs resources to do that because you have to, as it were, find out and most uh, directly from the person whether the person is a Ghanaian or not. Now, I think the U.S. interpretation was that we weren't meeting those times and therefore we were not cooperating. Mm. But especially in our kind of countries, it's sometimes difficult to decide just by name, that a person is Ghanaian. Because this is a country where some people are called Johnson, mm -hmm. some people are called um, Hopenbauer, some people are called Thomas, or uh, Berchi or something. So the fact that the person's name is supposedly Ghanaian sounding does not in itself say that the person is Ghanaian. Mm. I mean, like, you know, there are lots of Ghanaian names which you can find in Japan. So what, what do you say to that? It's a, just a matter of being careful mm. so that you don't land somebody in Accra who doesn't belong to you know, Accra and therefore who takes responsibility for that kind of person. We were just being very careful. Yeah. But because of that time frame, we were perceived not to be you know, cooperating. But happily, we have come to a certain kind of understanding. You and, have? Oh, yeah, yeah. We have developed um, a system okay. which is such that now even I'm sure the U.S. government finds it to be the, the kind of um, formula that other countries you know. Uh, is this something can you can use. elaborate on publicly or this is oh, behind closed Well, doors. it is nothing that is so... Um, um, what secretive or you know confidential it's just that we have managed to develop a system for ourselves where we make sure that whatever it is that we are doing we are doing it right and we are getting it right in terms of the time frame and whatnot but i still hold the argument that if somebody entered the states legally mm -hmm. It means that at the point of entry, after they've let him in, he has a certain contract with the United States in the sense that the person is going to obey the laws and the whatnot and the whatnot and the whatnot. So if at some point the U.S. decides that the person has breached certain aspects of the contract and therefore the person should be you know, deported, I don't see why I should be asked 
to provide papers as more or less uh, sanctioning the person's deportation. Because I believe that the U.S. ought to have documentation on that person. So they wouldn't need the embassy or anybody else for that matter to give, as it were, permission to, to, for the person to be deported. But the other side of the argument says that according to mm -hmm. uh, international rules, yes. a person cannot travel without travel papers. Mm -hmm. But my counter on that is that if you are deporting somebody, the person is not traveling normally. And therefore, on the basis of the fact that that travel is special and is backed by a certain kind of you know, legal documentation which says that the person has run foul of something and therefore has to be expunged from the society, I don't think that aspect of the ICAO rules should apply. But isn't the complication also such that the plane itself also travels under different rules? Yeah. So the person being brought to the country will not even be, the, the, the owners of the aircraft will not allow that person to sit on the aircraft without that documentation you are providing, so irrespective that, yeah, of what the U.S. position is. That one is uh, because that is what the initial rule about having documentation to travel, you know, uh, puts on the airline. Mm -hmm. So I, I, can, I can see this, and at the moment, I'm not holding fast onto that interpretation. And more so, I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I, I cannot probably even go to a court of law and successfully argue the point. Yeah. But at least I just want to uh, emphasize the fact that we at the embassy have managed to develop the kind of approach okay which should make it possible for the U.S. to lift the, the sanctions that they put on us. And I do believe that the U.S. would recognize this and then do what is right and proper. So you ha you, have you had any engagement since on the matter with the U.S. to at least brief them so that they can also say, well, Ambassador, your system, we like it? Oh, I, I, I could tell you that um, we, are, we, we relate very constantly. You know, so I believe that um, we're at least so far uh, we haven't received any um, words of unhappiness or dissatisfaction. But the ban hasn't been lifted. Pardon? But the ban hasn't been lifted. Oh, it hasn't been lifted because it was. Uh, it, it is not an instantaneous uh, anything, and the, and the fact also is that uh, assuming, as I'm saying, we have managed to you know, um, set up a system that works. Mm -hmm. uh, I think somebody is entitled to ask to give a certain grace period over which you will decide that, ah, actually, this is going to be very fluid and continuous. Okay. Yeah. But coupled with that perhaps must be something that is of a worry for you, and not just perhaps for you, but a lot of other diplomats, that when citizens travel to other countries, they are supposed to report themselves. Sure. But the we one, don't like reporting ourselves, do we? Well, that is the problem. The passport says, when you land somewhere, please inform your nearest um, embassy or what have you. Ghanaians don't. And because of that, should there even be emergencies where your embassy ought to be able to provide support? We wouldn't know what to do because we wouldn't know where to go. We wouldn't know whom to look for. For instance, there was a fire in New York mm -hmm. in which you know, uh, some Ghanaians uh, perished. Yes, you know, and this one soldier who was trying to you know, uh, save some people actually died. We got the story um, through the normal uh, news, uh, news sheets. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the only time we could take any action was when somebody wrote a protest or a complaint to the president's office that the embassy hasn't done anything about that. And fortunately, in that letter, the person quoted a phone number. So I used that phone number, got in touch with somebody who happened to have been uh, a relative of uh, one of those uh, who you know perished. perished and made contact and subsequently made contact with the city of New York 
And I met their director for emergency water. I've forgotten his title. And New York City, I must admit, in this particular case, did wonderfully. Supported the families and whatnot and whatnot. And subsequently, they even named the street on where that house, you know, that court fire was after the soldier. Wow. Yeah. But for that complaint and that uh, number, there was no way we could have done anything to help anyone. Just as, for instance, in the floods that they, you know, uh, we've had in the States, especially the uh, New Orleans uh, problem and all that, it's possible some Ghanaians perished. We wouldn't know because we don't have any information on them. And any time that I go into Ghanaian communities to relate, the one thing that I ask for is that please register with the embassy just so that, you know, if anything happens, we could be of service. At the same time, to even raise the question of people who want to vote, mm. you know, from the outside, that assuming ROPA is being uh, implemented to, be, to determine where you could vote and when you could vote and all that. We need to know where the concentration of the Ghanaian population is. We don't know. But somehow or the other, the average Ghanaian doesn't recognize the necessity you know, to do this. And I usually you know, cite the example of where one Ghanaian is going down the street this way. The other one is coming down this way. They pass each other without a glance, without a word. But after they've passed each other, both of them use the corner of their eye to find out whether the other person recognized he or she was a Ghanaian. That, that for me, is not the, the Ghanaian that I grew up to know. Mm. So I don't know why we, we don't seem to, you know, get things together. We, we are probably one of the few groups in the States, for instance, who don't seem to have godfathers in our communities. Mm. In the other you know, communities, you come in fresh, maybe make uh, accidental contact with me. Uh, do you know Mr. So-and-so? No, I will introduce you. So I take you to the one person that the community recognizes is more or less the Ophi Penny of some mm. sort. And he relates to you, tries to find out what it is, what you can do, and all that, and all that. Hits the community with, well, there is this fellow here that uh, maybe if we did this, might be helpful for him and all that. Then they put something together to support you to settle. And then when you make good, you take that same thing back for them to give to the next person. That works. So if you, if you went into the States, you know, these, there are certain jobs, there are certain professions that are dominated by certain you know, people from certain specific areas. Mm. The Ghanaians, for instance, are very you know, uh, large in the care industry. They don't have a control. Not, not a, a much clout in the care industry because they don't bunch together. In the same way that um, in areas where Ghanaians are a big you know, proportion of the population, they don't have a dog catcher in the council because everybody says, oh, I'm minding my business and that kind of. In the other communities, some of them are even getting into Congress. And the thing is, even if what you have is a cleaner in the council, when people are talking negative about your community and they see you come in, they stop. And they are always careful because they think you might hear something and go and divulge. But because we don't put ourselves together, we have lost the opportunity to develop the kind of community or political clout that should make a community stand. Mm. That is the difficulty we have. Okay. The second thing, I think this year perhaps the biggest thing on your agenda, mm. aside this, has to, still has to do with migration, but it's the other way around. Year of return, we are trying to bring a lot of people back home, sure. people with ancestral links to Ghana and whatnot. Exactly. How are the numbers looking? Can you share any numbers? 
Well, uh, we see a few people, but we have been told to expect thousands. Oh, the, well, there must there must be more than a few people even at this time. And you may recall that um, I came into town with a, a, a group of uh, members of the Black Congressional Caucus and the Speaker of uh, yes uh, of Congress. Yeah. And um, since then, and even before then, lots of people have been coming. And the thing is, it is not so much a question of bringing people to have the nostalgic experience of going to the door of no return and that kind of thing. Yes, we are commemorating that. But for me, the pith of it is to get black Americans and those who are in a position to take alternatives and invest, to visit the country. And whilst they are here, have the experience, take a look, and take a decision as to whether they will put in some of their funds into enterprises to develop the country. And besides the fact that we also ought to appreciate the fact that these are the forebears of people who left this country against their own will, had very excruciating circumstances surviving in America. They had to learn a language that they didn't know. They ended up knowing that language enough to write books, to write songs, you know, to write poetry and all that. The, the rather soft basis of education that they had, they held on to it and developed you know, scholars, uh, philosophers, scientists, and whatnot. And you marvel at the number of things in America that were actually invented by you know, black people. So in a way, we would also want to use the year of return to appreciate hmm. the fact that they survived, the, to appreciate their resilience, and to use that to advise that just as you did this when you came here, please go back home and look at the home you left and decide that you could make a contribution there. Because if Africa is doing well, it will reflect on black Americans. So there is a certain commonality of interest. Oh, okay. And I, and I think, for me, that is where we ought to be, you know, actually striking getting black Americans. And I tell you, there is a lot of capital in that community. And we ought to be able to encourage them to come and utilize a part of it at least to help us raise our own economic fortune. But you're the first person we've heard actually put it in this way because for a lot of Ghanaians, when they hear year of return, they are thinking, okay, mass pilgrimage to Ghana. Sure. Thousands are coming, thousands of tourists are coming who can spend money on everyday things. Sure. They're not looking at, you know, the next big black investor. They are looking at just the regular Joe who is passing through Ghana, spends a week or two, sleeps in a small hotel somewhere, takes a trip around, goes to the beach and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So the, the engineering of it has been, okay, these people are coming. That is why I asked you about numbers, yeah. so that at least we could then talk about it being, is it working as it is? Because... The expectation will be that by now your office will be inundated with visa requests to Ghana. Oh, as for uh, being inundated with visa requests to Ghana, yes, we have it. And at the moment, I'm having problems uh, getting visas, as it were, uh, processed In time. within yeah, certain spaces of time because of the sheer numbers and because of the fact that we, we don't have the, that uh, quantity of staff, as it were, to deal with those things. We take interns to help us. But because by our own uh, rules and regulations, you cannot pay an intern, it becomes morally indefensible to get somebody to come and do that kind of job for you and not give anything by way of even a sub for the person to help himself or herself with transportation and that kind of thing. So we, we have that problem. Okay. But if anybody that I have met within the last, say, three months is anything to go by, and the volume of visas that we have, you know, uh, as it were, processing, then, of course, Ghana is going to 
be seriously pressed, especially over the Christmas season. There are lots of people who are coming. Okay. And they are coming to hopefully have you know, uh, the opportunity to enjoy the uh, celebrated Ghanaian hospitality. But I'm more interested in people making it possible for them to recognize the potentials that we have in terms of socioeconomic development okay. and for them to put their money in. That one is very important. And I tend to talk to uh, black Americans and then the Americans who will be coming that the one thing I would want them to ensure is that they should not allow the Ghanaians to prevent them from doing what a visitor should do, that is spend money. Mm. Because Ghanaians tend to be so sweet that the things that people pay for in other areas, the Ghanaians, oh, yeah, it's all right, just keep it. And I'm telling them they shouldn't allow the Ghanaians to t tell them keep it, pay. <laughs> it's good yeah. they are telling them to pay, so they should come and pay. <laughs> yeah. All right, then. so we are speaking to Ghana's ambassador to the U.S. When we return from this break, we'll discuss a couple of things he's been doing in the educational sector. Very interesting for those of you who want to attend school in the U.S. Face to Face, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Face to Face uh, with Bafo Ej Bewa, Ghana's ambassador to the U.S. Now, ambassador, a lot of Ghanaians attend school in the U.S. And from what I understand, you've been trying to facilitate a few scholarships at certain universities. Is that working out? Well, it's working out, save for the fact that I think um, some of them who had been admitted, you know, especially by Andrews University, okay. uh, have had trouble getting the requisite visa to go. Uh, I've oh. mentioned this to the American ambassador, and uh, we are going to be uh, sorting it out. But, you see, our whole effort... So one of them is Andrews University? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And if I'm, with Andrews University, there's a, they have created a specific website, you know, to do this. So most people or anybody who is interested could go to that website and then, you know, pick up information on applications and, and whatnot. Okay, so this one, free tip from Ghana's ambassador to yeah. the U.S. We have know. also, uh, you know, struck um, a new deal with the University of Missouri, you know, their um, engineering and, you know, mm. mining uh, school. Uh, okay, science and tech and, union. Yeah, and we are also, you know, uh, trying to establish the protocols uh, on that. There are certain universities that... Um, we are also, you know, working on, including some of those that uh, when Ghanaians hear just the name alone, they think, ah, you know, that is it. So our intent is to make it possible for us to develop the workforce of the future because the world's economy is changing, ours is changing, and we ought to be able to prepare people to undertake the kinds of jobs that will be available because if we didn't, we'll find ourselves, you know, holding uh, the menial jobs in our own country because we don't have the requisite skills and qualifications to hold, you know, the bigger ones. So this is where I'm trying to, you know, uh, gear my um, educational, as it were, effort to try to, you know, get enough young people to go into those areas which the country obviously is going to need within the next uh, few years. Just to be clear, though, these scholarships don't go through your office or anything, because the funny thing about this we, we've heard is, you know, when scholarships are made available, all kinds of people try to influence it on the side. This has nothing like well, that. Well, this one, uh, they are all going to be protocols between us and the universities. Us being Ghana and the universities? Yeah, and the okay. thing is... We agree to a student. What we are working on is that even if the institutions will not give full scholarships, they give a rebate. Okay. And then the uh, extra, as it were, will have to be borne by one, either a government scholarship 
or support from uh, private, uh, you know, enterprises in this country, or you know, charities and, and what have you. And then also we are trying to ferret some support from organizations within the U.S. itself, mm. so that um, you know people can undertake you know the studies. So I hope that it is not going to be one of those, or people are not going to, as it were, uh, commute it into you know, some of those uh, that constitute difficulties for people to even access uh, you know, the, 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 the facility. And if I, in the case of Andrews, even if the person lives in the States, but the person is Ghanaian, Mm. They can access that facility. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And the, the, a fear that people have, and what normally ruins opportunities like this is those people go and don't want to return. How are you dealing with that particular situation? Well, I'm, I'm counting on one, uh, people's sense of um, propriety and nationalism. Two. Mm. We are also talking to the universities, like with the University of Missouri. They did tell, because they, they are so good that most of their um, equipment in the mining sector are provided by the big mining companies mm. because they know that their students are very good products. So as soon as they graduate, they pounce on them. And we are talking to them so that between us, the universities, and the employers, to actually get them to understand that we are not going to bring people who then come to perform, come out as you know, very good you know, products of the university, and immediately get you know, uh, snapped up by the companies, you know, and then they don't come back. We would want to make sure that they come back. That is the essence of the whole effort. That's a lot of work you have given yourself. Well, unfortunately, uh, it might not be very pleasant, but somebody has to do it. The only mm. thing that sometimes um, makes it a bit hard is that um, it is very difficult for anybody to say thank you to anybody in this country. And then also, you know, Ghana has developed a certain character where everybody seems to know the price of something, but they never reckon with the import or the implications of the choices that are made. They only mm. look at the price, but they don't look at the, you know, the, the uh, aftermath of you know, the purchase. Mm. That is the one thing that sometimes is a bit difficult to comprehend. And finally, for me, I don't have too much time. Let's talk a bit about trade. You know, Ghanaians want to send a lot of things to the U.S., but they say quite a few restrictions block their path. Do you engage Ghanaian traders in the U.S. and the yeah, businesses we do. they do? We, we have How are you helping them? I out? Have been, we have been encouraging Ghanaians to participate in trade fairs and whatnot. And then also under Agua, mm. Ghanaians can bring in goods. Are, are Ghanaians still taking advantage of Agua? Agua oh, yeah. seems to have no, lost it, its it has vim a, It for hasn't Ghanians. fizzled. It's just that, you see, again... Some people just don't want to pluck at something over a certain extended period. You know, if you are going to trade, and I can tell you that this happened when the World's Fair was in Tokyo, whilst I was there, was in Japan when I was there. Some people came under the guise of coming to, you know, exhibit oh. and, and as it were, trade. But most of them, Maybe the day before they get on the plane, they go to Makola, buy a, a few things and such, and then come you know, to, uh, to a, a trade show. No. You see, we, we don't make the significant effort to ensure that what we are putting on the market is competitive. Mm. Because sometimes certain things basically can even, in terms of even packaging, because you go to shops and such, I'm sure that maybe 50% of the time, what attracts you is the packaging. Before you go and find out oh, it's something that you don't even want. But we, we don't put particular you know, effort in doing that. And the thing is, on the American market, like on any, uh, in any country, we are certainly dealing with 
other people from all these countries across the globe for that one uh, purchase. So we have to do it and do it well. Okay. It's just that we need to encourage people to produce. We need to encourage people to market it well by all the packaging. And then we need to encourage people even within the administrative sector to get them to recognize that it is necessary for the nation's survival for us to export. South Africa, when I was in Japan, wanted to expand their market for South African wines. What did they do? They employed two Japanese. All that they were supposed to do was to make sure that South African wines are in the kinds of places where people are most likely going to buy. And I can tell you that within a short space of time, there was no respectable restaurant in Tokyo that was in stock in South African wines. So now, they are all over the place. With us, when we even ask for samples of some Ghanaian products for us to display, the manufacturer asks you who is going to pay for the shipping. You see where it, it immediately sort of it stops you in your tracks mm. because the person does not even recognize the necessity for us to even make that little effort to market on their behalf. So this and then, you know, people, even when you give the information that such and such is happening here, such and such is happening here, such and such is happening here, by the time they take their decision, it is probably too late for them to, you know, do whatever it is that they need to do to participate. I know that sometimes some of them also have visa problems. Okay. I was at a fair recently. There were two organizations that were supposed to go. They had booths that were set up, but they didn't have individuals to man them because they were refused visas in Accra. So these are some of the kinks that sometimes do happen. But we should make a serious and concerted effort to compete. And we have to stop thinking little Ghana, little Ghana. Because now, we happen to be an icon, whichever way we look at it, not only politically, mm. but in terms of trade and everything else. And especially where we are going to have the headquarters of the Africa Free Trade uh, you know, area here, we should start thinking and actually devising ways of utilizing that organization to expand our trade, and especially on the African continent. All right. Then. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Bar for a J. Bewa, Ghana's ambassador to the United States. It's been a great pleasure. Like I said, he, I can call him senior. Everybody yeah. understands why I call him senior. So it's but, been a pleasure having you on yeah, Face to Face. Thank you very much. Uh, My name is Godfrey Akotobuafo. I hope you sure. enjoyed this episode. Have a good day. <laughs>